Hi there, and welcome to the Grief and Rebirth podcast. I'm your host, author and trauma survivor, Irene Weinberg, here to encourage you wherever you are in your healing journey. In each episode, I chat with incredible grief and trauma specialists, healers, mediums, and celebs, as well as remarkable people who have inspiring healing stories to share. If you're looking for a podcast that's both uplifting and inspiring, you've found it. Let us help you find your joy in life. Hi, everyone. I hope this finds each of you so very well. I'm speaking to you from my studio in West Orange, New Jersey, and I could not be more delighted to have the pleasure of interviewing Stephen Tuig, who is a dedicated practitioner, guide, and international speaker in the transformative realm of shadow work. With 23 years of practice across many areas, including trauma, PTSD, addiction, homelessness, psychedelics, spirituality, and more. In his quest to understand the shadow, which consists of the often unconscious aspects of the psyche that hold hidden treasures as well as unresolved wounds and traumas, Stephen was guided by a series of synchronistic events and personal experiences that led him into the realm of self-discovery and inner exploration. Those synchronistic events and personal experiences brought him to various spiritual traditions, psychological theories, and healing modalities, inspiring Stephen to formulate a specific framework for understanding the human experience. Through his own inner journey and encounters with mentors and teachers, Stephen began to recognize the transformative power of shadow work in healing and self-realization. With a deep sense of purpose and a genuine desire to support others on their journey of self-discovery, Stephen honed his skills as a facilitator and mentor blending ancient wisdom with modern insights to create a holistic approach to shadow work that addresses the multidimensional nature of the human psyche. He continues to be guided by his passion for personal growth and spiritual evolution, inspiring others to embrace the light and shadow within themselves with courage, compassion, and authenticity. I'm looking forward to talking with Stephen, who will be speaking to us today from Eustis, Florida, about the trauma he experienced when he was three years old that inspired his calling, his work and study under the world's leading business and life strategist, Tony Robbins, the transformative power of shadow work and healing and self-realization, the impact of shadow work on psychedelic integration, and so much more for what is surely going to be a fascinating interview filled with enlightened healing insights. Hey, Stephen. A warm welcome to Grief and Rebirth podcast. Wow, Irene, I, I, I got to tell you, I am just, I'm floored by even the introduction. Thank you very much for having me on here. I feel just honored. Thank you. Well, we're a mutual admiration society today, and I can't wait to share you with everyone because I think what you're doing is just fantastic. And you're, I mean, talk about my passion for bringing people healing resources. Here you are. So thank you for this. And let's start by starting with the beginning. You had a deep trauma when you were just three years old. So how did that inspire this remarkable calling of yours? It's not everyone who decides to specialize in shadow work. No, it's, um, it's a calling. Yeah. You don't come here because you like the tea and the chips, <laughs> right? That's not <laughs> right. what brings people to shadow work. Um, it's usually, um, and I think it's con- it conducive to who we are as humans, but it, it, when the pain is staying the same is worse than the pain to change. And when I was three years old, um, my mother had an accident with her hands, um, and she, my dad had to take care of us. So he gave, um, we, my step monster, I like to call her my <laughs> step monster. Um, she locked me in the basement and she would lock me in there during the day and she beat oh me. God. She pulled my hair out. Yeah. I mean, a real deal kind of stuff. And it went on for several months like this before my mom found out what happened, but she starved me. Like we were, <gasps> took pictures. It was, yeah. And she would bring me back out during the day and at night and say, if you say anything, I'll kill you and your sister both. So 
you know, at three years old, it's pre-verbal. Like you, how am I going to even explain that level of trauma? And, you know, mom and dad are God at three years old, right? They're not, there's no understanding of what, trying to understand what that is. And I think at that moment, a part of me came online that said, okay, I got you, buddy. And the mind, I used to say, everybody, when we're, we're in crowds, like everybody repeat after me, thank you, mind, for keeping me safe, right? The mind did what it needed to do at that time to keep me safe. And one of the things it did was it started to plot from that basement. Like I dropped anchor, some part of me dropped anchor right there. And it said, I'm going to, I'm going to always be on the lookout for how this type of a situation can happen. Now, fast forward, I'm an adult, I'm talking to my wife and some part of me feels like she's trying, like, go look at the subjective experience of the story called your life and your intimate relationships and look at how there was just part of me that was certain she was trying to trap me all the Mm -hmm. time. And it was in business. It was that and that. And so wrestling with that, um, you know, it led me down all these roads, um, trying to fix the problem externally. And, um, you know, there are no accidents in shadow work, but it, it's like, I ran the wrong way the, for a long time before I realized I was running the wrong way. And you and had not, to heal it. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is I'm still healing it. When you say heal, it's like a past tense thing. I think shadow work is either being done. It's either doing or not doing. It's never done. Like I'm either aware of the fact that there's a fact I'm either aware of the construct that's running underneath the water that I feel like you're trying to trap me. Even in this conversation, is Irene going to say something that's going to have me go into a corner? Like there's a part of me online even now that's protecting myself always. And if I give myself permission to lean into that, um, it starts to create somehow there's this connection underneath the water, like the Rosetta Stone that allows you and I to translate um, our our communication, there's something going on deeper than what the 120 bits that I think I am. And that's what really got me hooked. It was like, okay, well, I get that I feel like I'm trapped, but why does it always line up? Like, you know what I mean? It's, it, well, you I know always. What? You know what? I, not to interrupt you, Stephen, but I'm totally relating to what you're saying because I also had a very dysfunctional childhood. And if my father didn't like something I was saying, I got punished. So it took me a very long time to heal that. Look at me now. It took me so years and years and years of healing to find my voice and oh, know. Wow, look at and this. Not, and look at what's going on. And look at the fact that now, if and to this day, though, if I say something that I don't think is being, is, the person agrees with whatever, I've taught myself that I can be myself and say it, but there's a part of me that's still saying, am I going to, is something going to come at me? Is this, am I going to get punished because they didn't like, Yes, what I'm that's saying. all. Yeah, all that right there. We 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 always say hello, shadow. Right, it casts itself on. And the interesting thing there, Irene, is if you really allowed yourself to, you know, go from the the leaf to the twig, from the twig to the branch, from the branch to the stem, from the stem to the the body of the tree down into the root of it, you would be able to feel where that little girl part of her, like I can see it in you right now. There's this little girl, and she's scared that she's. If I say this, am I gonna? How am I gonna get punished? Like. It's not a matter of if for me, it's, that's the, the be- it's the, the power of it. It's a matter of how right. it's happening. Right. Yes. Beautiful. So, yes. I mean, so it's like, we're, we have, we're so simpatico with our experiences. Yeah. So you had a series of synchronistic events and personal experiences that led you into this realm of self-discovery and inner exploration. And it introduced you to various spiritual traditions, psychological theories, and healing modalities. Tell us all about it, Stephen. Well, I mean, um, yeah, what is my journey to healing? And I think that, you know, I think that, I think that the path is a subjective experience. So it's different for everybody, but we're talking, you know, archetypal casting, young in psychology, human needs, psychology, wow. addiction, psychology, motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, talk therapy, uh, NLP, NAC, uh, Japanese, Nikon, Japanese psychology, Zen hollow bones. Wow. Um, I I've studied, uh, with a group of people called the mankind project now for, Oh, 24 years, April 14th. Um, I was, um, six months, I was probably about 10 months sober, uh, six months out of being locked up. And my son was being born. And um, I had just been a monster. And I had been constantly running from a monster. And in that aspect, turned into a monster for fear of that same monster. 
and was tired of running. And April 14th, April 15th, April 14th, I walked through the door. April 15th, I was brought face to face uh, on the carpet with my shadow. Now, what and year was this? April 2000. Okay. April so 2000. Our, our experience is around the same time because my yeah. accident happened and my awakening happened around all that time too. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yep. And then, and I, and I remember, you know, is that was the day that my son was born. Um, and the day I went through my weekend and I remember it, I, I remember I didn't, I didn't know what I know now. There was a part of me that came online there that said, that's it. And started just walk in that direction. Don't stop walking. Just keep going in that direction. I didn't know what I saw. And, and, and of course, most of me still asleep today, Irene, but some part of me was waking up. It was, it was some part of me saw, and I just knew that there was nothing in my life that, um, that that was the way. And if I was going to be any help to anybody, if I was going to in any way, shape or form, get out of that basement, that was the only way out. And so I just kept walking and I kept studying. I flew around, uh, I was flo flown around the world now, um, um, chasing this thing. What is shadow, you know, um, went to go work for Tony Robbins because I thought, well, the only way for me to be able to really study this was to be, I wanted to have time in the box. Like I needed a lot of time studying this. Well, Tony was doing it at a level. I saw him on TV, he stood somebody up. And within 30 minutes, that's like, you can't unknow what you've just learned about yourself. Like you can't forget that. I knew right then and there, and I wanted to study with the master. So I went and worked underneath Tony for a little over a decade, um, over 10,000 interviews with every level of successful business. He, he um, uh, commissioned me to interview over 10,000 businesses ranging wow. from your startup to your multi-billion. And each one of them, what I was doing was, how is shadow at play here? What's what's the thing that they're not seeing? And what I found was, I just don't know, Irene, if I can find one piece of suffering out there right now that at some level, shape or form, shadow is not at the root of it. Like at some level, it's like our, I think I'm going, like you said, it's like, I think that they're doing, I think you're trying to trap me in the basement. And then what I do, like, we'll just go back to my wife, for example, I will go, I'm trying, she's trying to trap me. So then I withdraw. So I pull in, right? Because then I want to assess the situation. I want to find out which, which road is the safest road out of this. Because you've been basement. so wounded. So you're not, yeah. you're, you can't trust but it. I'm not yep. conscious of it. You know, mm -hmm. the problem is, is that our, we've only consciously got 120 bits of information that we can be av aware of at any given time. I can only be aware of one, two, three, too many. And so what happens is, the Cartesian level consciousness were just layers and layers of meaning. Like right now, everybody at home in your head right now, just go, hello. How many of you said that out loud, right? In your mind, just say hello. And they never shut up, do they? They just never shut up. And that right there is more than just audio. It's visual. It's smells. It's, you know, right now, if you just imagine sniffing a rose, you'd rem you can, you can call up that pungent earthy, there's a full-fledged Hollywood studio going on up in your head and that you're always floating down the river of the story called you in the boat called now. You're never not in the river of the story called you. You've never been in the river of the story called Stephen. Well, that's just the inside the boat. Then you have the boat itself, which is the subconscious. I think I might be in at in the just the there's something I'm feeling that's not quite right. And it sits just beyond what that 120 bits can take in. But then you have the water as well. And most people call that the unconscious. And I think that's a mis it, it misaligns our awareness to who we are. That's the deep conscious. So I have this part of me down in my deep conscious, which is too painful because it was three years old. That was the most like mother I, I did. I, I went on a journey with. Uh, 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 ayahuasca journey, mother takes me down in that basement and I have to feel that terror because anything you don't feel, you can't heal. So now I'm in there. But when I'm, I'm, I'm on the surface of my life in the 120 bits in the boat, I can't hear that signal. All I know is there's something I feel is trying to trap me. Now I lean in. Valerie, one of her shadows is I'm going to get abandoned. So her mind, she sees me pull in and all she can do is translate that through her shadow. So what she feels is he's leaving and or or he's trying to not get caught, which is similar to trying not to get trapped. So she's translating it, but she's because the shadow is always at play, it gets tweet, tweaked ever so slightly 
to line up with the, the subjective experience of the story called her. This is what I call shadow boxing. I think that's genius. How When you look at relationships and how we ping shadows off of one another, I think that that's, I think that the mind is trying to write itself, Irene. I think that we are in the middle of billions of years of evolution and we are evolving inside of that evolution. And we've reached a point to where we've got to learn how to use certain switches and dials inside of our awareness that we didn't know we weren't taught were there so that we can clean the looking glass so that I don't have to come from that basement and I can see, oh, she feels like she's being abandoned right now. Oh, come here, sweetie. And I can lean in with love and not pull farther in because that uh, that fear of abandonment comes my fear of being trapped. And then we go into this power struggle. Right. Well, it sounds to me like people listening to this podcast are just many of them may be um, just realizing that they have a choice, that they have a shadow and they can choose to um, unload that shadow, to heal it, and and to um, have, move on with a better uh, life for themselves. Not because, and it's a conscious choice because my shadow pops up every once in a while, but I've healed. So I say, hey, there you are. That's right. Uh, you know, um, let me ask you, you formulated an under, uh, from this, all that you've done, you um, formulated a framework for understanding the human experience. Is that what you were just saying? Or is there more to that? Well, there's a lot more to it. I mean, this thing on the wall, I call this a construct. It's an illusion that we make up. So when I make sense of my reality, I've got a book. It'll be out, be out, I don't know, the end of April, it'll be out um, called Turning Within. And it describes all this. It's called The Construct. And my identity drives my narrative. If I've got the identity that I'm one of the one of the shadows I carry is that I'm a reject. I'm certain of that. And my in the in the plot that I live out of, the narrative that I live out of will never be something other than that because that's who my identity is. The voice that's in my head chattering is only going to chatter from that identity. And then that then in that there's a loop that that narrative runs on that's the story that I'm living out of which then is directed by my beliefs which then dictates my emotions, which then, and, <laughs> and so we have seven facets to our construct. And my work is about pulling these threads to go, okay, what happens when we do this? And what I found is much like working with psychedelics, this, if this is reality, we're reality creating. We are God. I believe that we're God. Having, I say it from a very practical perspective. It's the only logical choice at the end of the day. What is your definition of God? Oh, that's a great question, I, Irene, because it's a loaded word, right? And so right. I don't... Right. And you have a lot of people who have a lot of different definitions of God listening to this Well, and, and here's the thing. I believe that, you know, I'm going to give you... This is... I, I can't answer that question for anybody else. I can only answer it for Stephen, right? Because I believe the subject... The, the path to God lies in the subjective experience of the story called you. I believe that every religion dies with its creator. I believe... You know, uh, um, Gandhi said it best. He said, I, I love Christianity. It's all the Christians that I have a problem with, right? It, it, uh, you go and you look at Muhammad and you go in and look at a Buddha and you go look at, and what they were describing was their personal experience of God, the path that they took. Now, I can't show you how to get to uh, Disney World from where I'm at. And why? Well, because that's where I'm at. So, my 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 belief is that whatever whatever meaning they're holding on to that their belief of god is then that's correct whatever that is because i think at the end of the day i think the first the first directive of the mind is to create and navigate meaning and if i have a meaning that says this is the way god is or this is the way my life is if that's how i've been programmed then that's right that's exactly right it's like well if if I'm going to the law of attraction, if I can create my reality, then why am I not happy? Well, let me, and we dig underneath the surface and we go, well, all you're doing is thinking unhappy thought. That's the reality that you're creating. And my, the reality system that's inside of me, I, me and my reality are interrelated. Nobody can separate me from my reality, but me. And if we go, you know, there's a lot of people in psychedelic work that want to do what they call an ego death. They want to get rid of their ego. If you don't have an ego, there's Irene without an ego, you and I can't talk. I don't have any words. I lose language. I lose, I lose the very structure of what allows me to interact in this reality. And as I say that, it sounds really woo woo. 
but it's not, not really. You can see that by, okay, well, what's the story you tell yourself that steals your joy? Well, I tell myself I'm not good enough. And I bet you see that everywhere, don't you? I do. There's God right there. You're creating that reality so that you can experience that reality. I think at the end, somewhere in that statement, it, I think lies God. And that's why I've been following this road for 24 years. It's like, well, what is that? I don't know, but I'll see people that will go into some piece of work. And I mean, they're in it. One gal, um, she was in it and, and she was looking down and she was in a full fledged uh, uh, pity party in her, the structure, like, ooh, like in it. And as she was lifting her head up, she hit, I don't know, it was about eye level to the ground and everything stopped, like time froze, but it really didn't. You know what I mean? Like time kept ticking. But in the, what I saw from the outside looking in, like in my world, the tree started breathing. Like, and I was on no medicine. I was completely sober. I was managed, I was guardian of a spot. And then she continued to cry at the same exact frequency, but I could tell something had changed. She had gone from utter suffering to total, like, thank you. I am so great for you. Same level of crying, but for total gratitude. And I asked her the next day, I said, what was that? She said, that was the exact moment that I realized that I was special and so was everybody else. And in that equation right there, I believe it's God. That's God. So, okay, I, I agree with that. And so this, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the psychedelic yeah. plant the medicine in a minute, but Let's talk about how shadow work, for instance, how could shadow work help an addicted person who has used the substance to manage their trauma and other deep rooted problems? Because you deal with a lot of, you help a lot of addicted people. So we, give me we, an example of that. Yeah. So first off, I believe that first off, shadow work is not therapy. It is an advanced form of, I call it uh, active contemplation. It's the best way to explain it. I'm going to learn how to think about my thoughts in a way that allows me to get outside of my thoughts. And in the specific shadow work, we, we look at suffering to help us kind of understand that because it's squeaky wheel gets the oil kind of thing. Um, with addiction, what, what we're finding, if you're going to read anything on Gabor Mate's work, you know, the myth of normal, stuff like that, we're finding that most of these addictions are simply covering up their, they're the, they're the most, again, thank you, mind, for keeping me safe. They're, they're a way of maintaining as opposed to dealing with. So it's medication. It's more of a medication than anything. And shadow work is about going into that muckiness and going, okay, let's start to, let's kind of get past all this and see if we can connect you to the truth of who you really are. Like it, it, it goes past all that. So I have a, a great, theory. I hmm. have a theory, Stephen, and please tell me if I'm, if you don't agree with me because I'm, I'm happy to learn. But my, my theory is that people who become very addicted are using the substance to help them with their suffering to, oh, it's lifting them out of their pain in that moment, in that time. And they're not in touch with why they need that. Yeah. I come why from they're, why they're choosing that. Yes. It's, 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 that's, let me, let me, let me. And so you, <laughs> cause that's exactly <laughs> right. It's, you know, I grew up in the 12 step community, friend of Bill's um, long, love the 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 12 step community because i at that point i needed to be brainwashed i needed to i needed to find a group of people that could help me and they have a process called the 12 steps that comes from uh we now find we now know comes from a psychedelic journey that that bill w took um but talks about taking these 12 steps and as we're going through the 12 steps it's a going down in and taking a personal inventory, admitting to your God, to yourself, and to another human being, the exact nature of your wrongs, like really going in and, and doing shadow work at a very core level. It's like once you go down and you start to see what the mechanics are that are driving the addiction, I always, there's, there's a saying that we say in the rooms. It's like there's nothing that ruins a good relapse like a head full of recovery. Right? You start doing this work and you start seeing Oh, this thing is leading to that other thing, which is causing me to, to be in pain over here, which is leading me to use. I see the loop now. And it's like starting to be able to break out of that with an understanding of how to restructure the very programming that we stand on. That's fabulous. How about giving us an inspiring story about how a person's life was healed and transformed by shadow work? 
Mm -hmm. I'll bet you have about 9 million of them. I've got a couple. Yeah. Um, <laughs> every Monday night we run an integration group and I can go there. Um, but I, uh, there's a gal I know who um, I just love her. She came to us because she came to the work because she was trying, she had a stiff person syndrome. What's um, a stiff person syndrome, please? Well, she just be driving down the road and all of a sudden the muscles in her throat would lock up and oh she my. couldn't breathe. Yes, oh, wow. very oh, intense. Yes. Now, again, this is not therapy. I am not a doctor. Matter of fact, I'm just a guy who's bumped his head up against every single thing here. That's really, there's nothing tragically terminally unique about me. So she comes to me and steps on the carpet. And I said, so what brings you here? She said, well, I want to heal myself. And I'm like, well, I need to let you know right now, I don't have any special powers. Like that, that's not what this carpet does. And she says, I know. She's doing work with Joe Dispenza and she's doing work with um, Wim Hof and she's got all these certifications, but she's still, still got this deal. And we do a piece of work and then we do another piece of work and then we do another piece of work. And is this with the medicine? This is what this the is no med. Well, this is no medicine. This is just shadow work. Just shadow um, she's, work. She's working with uh, ayahuasca, uh, bufo, mushrooms. So she's doing all that as well. Um, this is never like this is typically an entourage. When people come to the work, they're typically they're already deep up in something and they're needing help unraveling what it is that they're finding. They're not just, Oh, ah, let me go do shadow work. So they're doing mind. the, so they're doing the plant medicine and it's unearthing their shadows. And now they're coming to you to work yeah. on that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a standard thing. They'll go in and they'll unpack the medicine now unpacks this thing. And now they're stuck in the, I what don't do I know do what with to this? do. Right. Yeah. And then they come to me and it's like, well, you're ready to take a look. And we actually go into that muckiness and, they can now understand why like shadow work. The beauty of shadow work is when you get, when I get underneath what drives me, it's like, no wonder why I keep bumping my head. I'm ramming my head. There's, there's a wall there. I got to go around. Oh, that changes everything. And it's like, it's like that. And so she, she did a big piece of work around, you know, she was physically assaulted as a very young girl. Oh, and, wow. Oh, um, wow. And, and what that taught her to do at, and through the whole structure of it was to hold on, hold on. And if you teach yourself to hold on, hold on, hold on. Now, you know, she's, and so she, now she's directing her, you see the work out of it. And then no more, she's, she's gotten off the medicine. Again, it's a, it's a whole cadre of things how that you fabulous. Bring so people. how wonderful for her. I can give you, I can give you examples of, I had a gentleman who, uh, came to me because he wanted to grow his business. He had $9 million business, wanted to grow it, sell it, exit it, just started doing the work, realized that the whole purpose of the business was to be good enough because he always felt like a loser and he needed to fix something. And so he would create problems in the business just so that he could validate his experience so I could fix something so I wouldn't feel like a loser. And if I didn't have that, well, then I'm just going to get stuck feeling like a loser. Well, we go down and do the work so that he can identify that part of him. He can tend to that wound. And like you said, when it comes up, notice it, not come from it, and create more karma out of it. And now all of a sudden, we're not, we didn't exit, we're not selling it to, we're not moving up now. What we're doing is he's, he's now downsizing, moving into a smaller, and that's going to create for him a much more efficient and effective exit in the business because he's not doing it. Because again, he was just leading to more problems. That's all he was doing. I can give you, um, I can give you, a, I mean, we can go as far down, down into the intensity of it. I've seen situations to where people are just the side of, I don't know what to do with myself. I mean, I'm on the front right now. I left Tony Robbins five years ago to follow this plant. We're going to get into that in a minute. Right. And so now I'm, I left the big money job, left the, like, left the, like I was, I was set. I, I was Tony's senior business strategist. The entire division was built around me traveling around the world, speaking in front of thousands of people to, to make pennies and follow this plant because <laughs> I'm researching shadow work. And I'm telling you the people that are on the front lines here, um, this is the front lines. Like it, we're doing it down here in Orlando and these people can't make it to Peru. They can't, they, they got nowhere to go. And mother has given me a vision. And so I Wait, drank the mother, medicine. Mother is mother. Yeah. Now we're moving right into. So right. mother, I, I, tell everyone how you, re, how you refer to mother. Yeah. So I, I I'm working for Tony. I'm about, you know, I'm, t I'm 10 years in, I'm, I've reached a point to where I know I need to kind of, I've, I've outstretched the the space. I've outgrown my home. It's time to move out. My right? dad, it's time to move out of the home. 
that's basically what it was. And I knew I couldn't just leave and, and say, cause I, everything I, I worked for Tony. So it was all Tony says, Tony says I needed something real. And so mother, I came to this friend of mine, introduced me to the concept of ayahuasca. And I have to tell you, Irene, I didn't do any research. I'm not a research. I trust the guy that, that pointed me in the direction. I trust chance chance said, try this out. I jumped in and um, I call the, I call ayahuasca mother. I've done 28 ceremonies. I've gone through a lot of work. She's shown me a lot of things. I've earned the right to call her mother. And um, on the second ceremony, on the set, again, I knew nothing. I knew nothing. I didn't know there was a female they call mother Aya. There's a spirit in the medicine that they call mother Aya. I didn't know any of that happened. I didn't know I had steak the night before. Like I didn't, I hadn't prepared for this and I'm in a daytime ceremony and I look over and I close my eyes. What it looks like from you to me is I close my eyes and, and inside me, I open my eyes up. So in me, it looked like, it felt like I woke up. It felt like, it felt like I woke up from a dream that I didn't know I was having. It's the best way to explain it. And um, I looked over and there's this beautiful lady and, and she's just looking straight ahead and she doesn't care whether I notice her or whether I don't notice her, whether I talk to her or I don't talk to her. She's just love, like unconditional love doesn't have any expectations. I understand now what um, the, the, the Irish Catholic Christians were talking about when they say that, 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 that grace is a divine right. It's not saving grace. We are just born. We are, it is our divine right. And she's just... Even, and I was in the middle of a conversation with mother. When you take these plant medicine, you'll get about a decade's worth of information that's been compressed into just a couple hours. So I was in the middle of the conversation and I remember her saying, yep, it's all make believe. It's all pretend all the way down to the very gaze of God. And then I woke up and I looked around <laughs> and I'm like, Ooh, cause I came with completely different set of questions then what I was be, I didn't know what, the, what was that? And I looked up and I saw these weird things going on in the trees. And then I closed my eyes again and I fell asleep or I woke up depending on which end of the stick you're on. And now I'm in my shadow. Like I am seeped up in this, this feeling of, I am going to be, I'm certainty that this is the worst. I am the worst person on the planet that's ever walked on the planet. There's nobody that's lower than me. Everybody in this place it deserves to be here, but not me. And I mean, I'm in my suffering and I look over to her and Irene, I asked her, I said, so then why do we suffer? Ooh, if it's all, pre- right. I, it's like, if we're all, it's all yeah. make believe. Why and, do we and suffer? I, if I'm God having a human experience, then why am I suffering? And you know what she did, Irene? She laughed at me and I woke up and she didn't laugh at me as in, you know, like a bully would laugh at me. She laughed at me as in, it, as in, I, I knew you were going to ask that, like, that was the most logical next question, like kind of thing. And then I woke up and it took me a long time to realize that's the whole point. The whole point is for me to be able to see when I, I now can go into a basement. If there's somebody that's stuck in some structure of a story that they haven't been able to, because I'm going all the way through that and I'm going all the way to the well. I want to go all the way to source. That was that was my ass was have a clear channel, a clear path to take people through that would take them all the way down to their truth. And mother then said, okay, the only way out is through. So then she took me right to my shame. And from there on out, I start purging and, and, and the journey began, right? And the third ceremony, she gives me another vision and another vision. And now I have this mission um, to stand here. And it's like, I am a doula. That's the best way to explain it. I'm a spiritual doula. I'm standing on the other end of creation going, okay, what's coming? And my job is to kind of stand here and help support the, the genius that I see now coming through you. My job is to see your genius for the amazing woman that you are and to help birth that through. And um, that's beyond me. That's it. So it sounds too. So wait a minute. I just I have four questions at the same time. Okay. So um, so you're talking about ayahuasca. Mm-hmm. Is that the same? Are, and you see, you're really involved with ayahuasca, which gives them really gives people very deep insights, and then you help them to process it to heal. What's the difference between using that as opposed to mushrooms and to the other substance? 
uh, ketamine and, you know, all the other substances that are also out there because I have been hearing about those substances also used. And I also want to stress to people who are listening to this interview and thinking about it is you need a very well qualified guide while you're going through this experience. It's not a, a, it's not a toy, it's medicine, it's plant medicine. So you need to do it with someone who really knows what they're doing and can help you interpret what it's revealing to you. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So let's take a couple steps back and walk into this conversation because some people are at the very beginning of it. You're right. exactly That's right. That's why and, I'm asking these questions. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't go, let's just, let's just call it what it is. You wouldn't go a halfway, you wouldn't go across country without planning for that trip. Right. Why would you ever go across dimensions, across realities, whatever, whatever the experience, why would you go into the deepest part of yourself? We can go any way that they were without planning for that and then unpacking that journey in a way that gets the most I know of a lot of people that don't believe in that but I believe I learned the hard way when I didn't prepare for my interaction the last thing you should if anybody on this in this podcast imagine if you've ever been with mother aya I had steak the night before like if not you're going to come out you're it loosens the sphincter muscle here and here and anything that's in there is coming out and so out came, you know what I'm saying? And I'm trying to, but so let's back up. So there's first, let's start off. There's, there's, there's drugs, there's medication, and then there's medicine. Drugs are what we use to mask the pain. Medication is what we do to manage the pain. Medicine is what we take to heal what's on, to go through and right. to heal what's on the other side of it. That's always been for me when I'm working in this field, it's like, are we, are you taking this as a drug? Are you taking this as a medication? Is this a medicine? Because we can use we can use anything at either way, right? Addiction is addiction. Like addiction isn't just to a chemical. I get addiction to I get addicted to identities. Like I get addicted to I get addicted to stories that I tell myself, right? So the plants are considered medicine. It's plant plants, medicine. Plant so the, medicine. The plant medicine is the part that heals the pain. Yeah. Well, what it does is it gives us. I believe what it does is it gives us what we call cognitive flexibility. So I would talk about the shadow, right? that shadow of being trapped. Now I feel myself going there and I now know where that is. I now know where I, if you've ever seen how they catch monkeys in India. I now know where I'm holding on. So I know where to let go. And that makes sense to me because I, oh, I, now I know where the basement is because I've had to do that work. Mother take me down the basement and said, you know, keep moving forward, took me through that basement. That's medicine. Now I don't have to live in that basement. Some people they will like cannabis can be medicine where she can show you your paranoia. People get paranoid. Well, that's not something the medicine's doing to you. That medicine, the, the, the plant medicine, cannabis is a plant medicine is showing you that, but you can also use that as medication to cover up because it's a nice warm blanket is what cannabis is. So I believe each, um, you know, what is Wait the a difference? Minute, go back. Cause a lot of people have been enjoying their, their, uh, Cannabis. Cannabis. Yes. And uh, I, you you refer to it as a, a comforting blanket? I think it's a pla I think I think that cannabis is a, a master teacher. I think that cannabis is like ayahuasca in that aspect. Uh, cannabis is a master teacher. And if I learn to develop, understand my relationship with the plant, I can deepen my ability to learn and interact with with the medicine. And I can also use it as medication. If I just want to calm down, I don't want to, I'm just going to go take some cannabis to help. There's nothing wrong with medication. There's nothing wrong with drugs. I, at the end of the day, it's not, it's not the drug that's the problem. It's the relationship with the drug that's the problem, right? And what's it, fueling that relationship, which is, a, which right. is the shadow. The intention, yes. Now, why do you lean towards ayahuasca as a po more than mushrooms or all the other? I work with mushrooms. I work with oh, mushrooms. Do. I work with mushrooms. I work with cannabis and I work with ayahuasca. I've yet to work. Uh, Ibogaine is on my, uh, which is another one that's on my, I don't oh, work with. That's what I haven't heard about. What What is that one? Well, Steve? Ibogaine is what they call, They many people refer to it as the grandfather plant. So you have ayahuasca, then you have I, uh, uh, I ayahuasca mean, comes from is it it's indigenous to brazil or to south america it's i i ayahuasca is the the combination between the ch chacuna plant or the chacuna vine i'm going to get this wrong and everybody's going to correct me and the ayahuasca the ayahuasca vine and the chacuna plant they come together and what that does is that strips out the maoi inhibitors it allows you to because everything has dmt in it which is what ayahuasca is everything has dmt in it but 
And uh, DMT we, is? Uh, dimetyl something, methylene something. Big uh, long word. Okay. It's, yeah, it's, it's, they call it the God, mar the God particle okay. because it, it will, it, it's in everything, literally in everything. But when you mix these two, I think this is interesting, two plants out in the middle of the jungle come together and create this ability for us to have this journey. And how did they know? You know what I mean? So it's like, well, why are you working with ayahuasca? Well, I'm, I'm working with ayahuasca because this is where the journey, as I continue to work out with shadow work, Mother Aya was my next teacher. And I'm just finished. I think I might be coming to um, some kind of a threshold as the book finishes, as I start to look, lift my head up and look around um, and see that this is, I'm just one voice of many voices now that are coming through this field, coming down this path. And so I'm excited for where we're going and what's coming next. I think that's wonderful. You know, it's sort of the way I look at, um, <clears throat> there are loads and loads and loads of podcasters, right? But bravo for all of us, because we're all helping people. I don't see right. it as a com competition at all. Um, I, I mean, each of us is serving our community. Well, and you'll notice that that's, the, that's, that's your ability to hold that space. I would be willing to bet if we kind of processed it out and looked at it from a shadow work perspective, your ability to hold that line and come into a collaboration type mindset is the, is, is paramount to some level of how you got the success that you've got, uh, that, that need to identify in a competition is an ego based. I believe this, the third directive of the mind is survival rooted. It's a survival rooted hijacking that says, I have to survive by taking ground from you. Whereas this new, when we start to see the new way it looks, when I allow my genius to come online and I fully live in the structure of the gene, my, my mission is to create a world that unlocks the innate genius that's lying dormant in the human condition. I believe we all have genius. Genius isn't some individual. It's the unique expression of the universe coming through you and as I allow my unique genius to come through, some part of you, much like when you're in shadow, you tend to, I, when I'm in shadow, I tend to trigger other people. When my wife is in shadow, I send the same thing holds true. Shadow begets shadow. Well, being, being in my genius begets genius. And as I stand up and stand in my power and my, what I call the axis mundi, the center of me comes online, you see that. And through you seeing that, you go, that's exactly right. And then you step into your genius, which is what you're doing here. That's how we're able to come together. And, and through your genius standing online and my genius standing online, there's a third level of genius that opens up and we enter into what Mark Gaffney calls a unique symphony of, of what I would call genius comes online in this, this, this third level of genius. And I think our society, when we let go of the survival rooted because survival rooted thinking is all based on what happened back there. Well, the threshold of change is happening too fast now. What uh, the CEO founder of Google said, we had as much new information as uh, 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 from the beginning of time until the time of Jesus. And now uh, that data double rate is now doubling every second by 2015. Wow. Wow, yeah. Wow, so wow. it's like, that's how fast we're going. Just look in your personal lives. It's happened collectively. It's happening personally. What if that all happened for a reason and it served us? It's meant so that I can't keep running my life based upon where I came from. I can't keep living my life as if I'm running it through the rearview mirror, comparing where I'm going to where I came from. That works great when you're pulling out of the driveway, but when you're on the interstate doing 80 miles down the road, you can't keep driving through the rearview mirror. I think we're being forced to wake up. I think that this all points to you go read like Watiko and you go read a lot of other, it's all doom and gloom that this is all pointing to something needs to change or else. My belief system is this is the very pointing of changes here. It's not an or else kind of thing. This is what's going to happen because you can't drive your car like that. Right. You know, Stephen, they, there's a, and I know you're very aware of this. They taught, there's a lot of talk about the fact that where the planet as a whole is rising in vibration from a 3d denser, reality to a 5d and everything Absolutely. you're talking about and everything that i just said about the collective consciousness as opposed to the competitive uh concept is all about rising to the 5d consciousness so this leads me to ask you why do you believe that we are on the cusp of proper mental health care is that having to do with plant medicine and why do you feel this will spur global innovation well you it's here's an this isn't 
I can't prove this, but what, let's just look at it. So um, you can, you can see how people understand there's a, there's a word for it. I don't know what the technology, but you can understand every society understands the mind uh, by the emerging technology. So you go back and you look when hydraulics came online, blood flow and leeches became a massive, at least we still use leeches now for some things. So there is value in the hydraulic system being monitored, but it was so bad that in France, they, they would import like, it was either like 70 tons of leeches every oh year. God. Yes. Oh it became God. hard to find so the you're, leeches. So, you, you're, so you're filled with your shadow. You're going crazy and you're struggling and there are yes. leeches all over you. Oh, Ew. could you imagine? So I have this crazier. feeling that something, you just need some leeches. And <laughs> I feel like the life is being sucked out of me. And then they would just put leeches on you. Of course, that's what. So then we go into, we just go in, let's fast forward. We go to the industrial age. We go into the computer age and we we understand that the mind is like hardware, uh, the or the brain is like hardware, the mind is like software. Well, now we have these things coming online like um, augmented reality and um, what they call extended reality and virtual reality. And now you add psychedelics into that. I think, Irene, and this is just this is just my sneaky little suspicion. Irene, I believe our kids as kids are going to understand altered dimensions like we under, remember when we were kids and how um we would the, the 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 vcr or for me it was a select division that's how old i am right would blink we're 12 saying, i'm so old that i remember when we when tv was first invented and my family uh, got a big block tv in black and white <laughs> yeah like right like look at technology how it's evolved but do you remember how your parents didn't know how to change the vcr clock and you right. just kind of knew Right, right. Isn't that and I think that that points to where we're going. I think our kids as kids are going to understand altered states like we understood changing the the clock in a in a VCR. I just think that's that's how the human mind works. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. So, I want to let you tell everyone because now they're fascinated and they would love to work with you. So, please describe your app, your mental cleanse process, your shadow tribe shadow integration circle and any other offerings that you'd like to tell everyone about. Oh, thank yes, these are my um so first we'll talk with the mental cleanse. So, there's a book out called it Turning It's Turning Within. Go go get the book. I think I give uh, I give as much away as I can give. Um, that's the goal is I get, I, here's the structure of what I think is going on. And it's a little different than maybe what we've been taught. And I may be crazy, but go check it out. It's just a book. And then if you find, want to take a deeper dive right now, you just go and you, you, you search for shadow work app or mental cleanse app on your phone. You can do that at your leisure. I wanted to remove Irene with the mental cleanse app. The goal here was to try 30 days of no complaining. I started it about oh, eight wow. years ago. I don't know if yeah. many people could graduate to that. Well, <laughs> you'd be surprised it's, it's how much how much harder it is than you think. No complaining, no I offlizing, uh, negative bias, confirmation bias. Anytime I go, I'm going to get attacked or some kind of a judgment of an attack, that thought needs to be uh, needs to be inspected. That's how it started. It's a simple four-week process. We uh, we we've built an app around it because there's no re you can't you don't have to come drink the medicine. You don't have to go to a Tony route. You don't have to walk on fire. All you have to do, I'm going to show it. This is it's real hard, guys. All you have to do, watch. Here it is. That was it. I just did it. Literally, I'll do it again because you might have missed it. Ready? That was it. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to fuck. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is go. How am I? How am I, what is the plot that I'm swimming in right now? And it's a four week journey. And we, the first week is, isn't that interesting? Second week is what else could this mean? The third week is what if it served me? And the fourth week is purging and cultivating. Uh, and in that four weeks, I am telling you, I've seen, we're going on 10,000 people come through this process, countless, countless people. And the reason why is because it starts right where you're at. All I have to do is go, what is the story I'm telling myself that steals my joy? Oh, there it is. And notice you're always telling yourself that same story, aren't you? I am. And what if you could what if you could clean that? That's what the mental cleanse. I love we have that. A, we have I have clients, I have uh, coaches and guides that are trained to kind of support that. I have a Friday where I support that. And then we have uh, every Monday night, if you go to theshadowtribe.com, um, you will get invited into a Facebook group is where we're at right now as we load a bigger structure coming online. Um, but every Monday night at 6 p.m., 
we uh, we do the work. It just is what it is. We do the work and we open up the container as best we can to on Zoom. We go as far as we can go down the road without being face to face because there's just some work that I there's just some work we don't touch because it's it's just there's too much there's too much mechanically there's not enough there's not enough there's not enough safety in the container to allow my mind will only go what it, what it feels safe doing. How many people do you usually have in these sessions? Because I mean, what? they obviously share. And so is it like a cohesive group or do, does the yes. construct change? It's the process stays the same. So the goal here is to be able to have these groups as we continue to grow um, because they're all tied to what's called shadow ceremony and they'll be able to continue because this is integration. It's not a pro it's not an event. It's a process. Shadow work is a, is a process. It's, it's, it's never, it's always another layer of the onion. All I'm doing is constantly waking. Right. And so this supports that. And right now it's on zoom. We get about, we can get anywhere from 35 to 45 people and we may break those people down into three different rooms. So we might have anywhere from, you know, 10 to 12 to 15 people in each room and we just do the work. It's that easy. Like without seeing it, uh, it's hard to explain. It's like trying to explain what the color seven smells like. Um, that's Monday night. And then we have a thing called shadow ceremony. Now, um, shadow ceremony is a gift that was given to me by the medicine, uh, ayahuasca. Um, the mushrooms um, have a big piece. Cannabis has a massive uh, piece in it. And it's work that I've been doing. It's a collaboration between all of those uh, 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 shadow work that I've learned from various places, be it Voice to Men, Mankind Project, be it, be it Hollow Bones, be it on and on and on and on, right? Um, all of that collaboration tied with everything I've learned from Tony Robbins, everything I've learned in 12-step, and and the medicine gave me a process where we um, set up a container and slowly walk you down into the deep conscious to walk you through the cave that you fear to enter uh, into the shadow, the place you hide, repress, deny, through that to get you to what I call your sacred well, the, the center of you, so that decisions, the problem is, is our decisions have become a point of coming from without. If I can get this, maybe I'll finally, again, not be a loser. Maybe I'll finally not be. And there's this unconscious process where the mind projects the pain out into the world. And I think it's because the mind is trying to right itself. It's trying to get back to its center. And we're struggling with that. And so we we throw those struggles on the wall. This goes down in and unravels all that, but takes you past all of it to connect you something else that I couldn't really describe for you here. Um, Cause as soon as I say that, it's like, well, that's my experience. That's not somebody else's. Right, right. So. But what I would say is it's the difference between a living your life unconsciously on autopilot motivated by, or, or pushed by your shadow, right. Yep. As opposed to living life in a conscious way where now you're aware of your shadow, you've healed it and you're moving forward. And when it trips you up or it's there, now you're conscious and you recognize it and you also have choices now. You're not just reacting to things on that autopilot. Now you're thinking through in a conscious way I like, in your life. I like to say that, I like to say the difference between people doing shadow work and not doing shadow work is that people... People that don't do shadow work are crazy. People that do do shadow work are crazy, but they know it. <laughs> you know what I mean? They know what that yes. means. They understand right. that. The deeper truth here, what this work is, because the work with the medicine, the work with the shadow tribe, um, the work with my, my mentors, where it's taken us to now is it's moved past the suffering. Because here's the other part that's really the, the hidden truth underneath all this. Well, what is the meaning of all that suffering? If at the end of the road, <laughs> again, if it's all about suffering, what is the purpose of all of it? And mother laughed at me because the purpose of it is the purpose of it. Like learning to do this work in such a way, the practice that we use is called turning within. It's a specific school of shadow work. And what we do is we're not turning within as in going within to face the shadows or though that is happening. It's turning within as in realizing that the world is coming from, is being, life comes from within you. And, and, and we are going to, like, you're going to tell yourself a story. You're going to live your life. You're going to die. The question isn't whether or not the next decision is going to kill you. It's what road do you want to die on? And once you've done that, now everything changes. Now the shadow isn't something to be overcome. 
it's like what it's like what looks like chaos to the fly is an extension of the spider. The shadow then becomes a part of me that goes, oh, I'm triggered. What part of what's going on? Oh, I see you're triggered. Oh, oh, I see what's going on. And now somehow mother told me third ceremony. She said, love is love is the key. Love is the Rosetta Stone. Love is the all. I, as a practitioner of shadow work, first, I need to lock in the key. I need to learn to love myself where I've forgotten to love myself. And as I do that, I now realize through the Rosetta Stone where your block is now at. And once I see that, now we can go into this deeper level of communion, which then opens up the third piece, which is love is the all. So I've been tracking all this, doing these experiments. And my ask for your community, Irene, is real simple. You guys start doing the math. Like, I want to start, we came back from a shadow ceremony, Irene, and um, we entered into a 12-hour, there must have been 15 different examples of how the only way that this could happen this way is if it was all mapped out. We enter into a level of enchantment with life. First rule of shadow work is that we're lying to ourselves. There's a layer of this that once we get underneath that, everything gets really woo-woo. It's my invitation to all of you listening is to look for the woo-woo in your life. What if that uh, suffering that you're resisting isn't meant to be resisted? What if that were your gold that was so bright and so powerful at one time that it scared you? And because of that fear, you buried it and you buried it under judgment. And you're afraid, what you're really afraid of isn't your shadow. Your deepest fear is not that you're inadequate. Your deepest fear is that you're powerful beyond measure. And every piece of shadow that you're experiencing in your life is an opportunity to unlock some genius, some gold, some insight that's been trapped in you yearning to come out. It moves past all this. Just let's move past the suffering of it. Let's get out of the driveway. Let's put this car in drive and let's see what the human the human condition is truly capable of if we let go of the survival rooted programming and stepped into reality creation for what it really is. And what really is reality creation? You are God having a human experience and any experience you have is the experience that you've decided at some consciously, unconsciously to have. And by learning how that works, you learn how to drive this vehicle called reality for yourself, not for Stephen, but through Irene, right? And when you do that, I see that. And when I see that, you see that. And now we start to find, instead of my sleep causing you to sleep, now my um, consciousness for what little bit, like we're still looking, like we're little babies looking through a keyhole into a room that we've yet to enter, right? We don't even know what's on the other side of it, but we think we can see it all. My little bit of seeing that keyhole sees your little bit of seeing that keyhole. My The glint in your eye I now see is the genius in my own. And so now we've entered into a different symbiotic relationship. Right. And I think that's what the world is calling for today. That's what we really need. And this is a perfect, perfect introduction to Stephen's personal trip tip for finding joy in life. Let us know what that is, Stephen. The tip for joy in life. Uh, joy, I believe joy is our natural state. The mind wants to write itself. Give myself, I have found that my, my ability to feel joy is a direct reflection from my ability to be human. Oh, that's beautiful. The more I allow myself to be human, um, the more I allow you to be human. And when I allow you to be human and when I allow myself to be human, some kind of divinity that I can't put into words some level of joy that just can't be explained pokes its head out like it's sneaking a like a wink and a nod from the universe going you're all right where you need to be buddy that's my key is that remember you're, you're human having right. a would, god would experience. you say that doing the shadow work helps you drop that a lot of that backpack that keeps us away from having joy the, the suffering I, I yeah i don't think that i don't think there's any other way to get there i don't think that i think that with today's world the, the programming that we have, like you, you look at television, they call the, the programming is just filler. It just tries to take us from commercial to commercial. Everything is doom and gloom. Like we are, we are, we are creators that have been programmed to be consumers, 
most people don't design the ideal. They just manage the circumstances because they don't know that there's another way. It's like, why would I deal? Why would I let go of the demon that I have to reach for the demon that I don't? And I'm here to tell you by leaning into this work, you come to find out that there is no demon, that the demon that I've been holding on to is that fear of my own ability to love. Right. And as, and as you heal, you also release, as you talk about karma, yep. because you're healing it as you go, you know, Stephen, <laughs> right? You're oh right. yeah. I, I I think I, when you look at karma, it's like subjectively speaking, I don't, I don't get trapped in that basement anymore. So then I see where her, where she's at. So then the karma wheel turns and we come back around again. It's like, oh, I was just here. I know what this is. This is triggering that. Now I'm even more present for her, which allows her to be more present for me. The If I'm driving down a road and I've got the steering wheel turned left and I'm trying to go right, well, the steering wheel has to move all that to go back to get to where that's karma. It's real simple. We've got to allow the, allow the system to go through the process and, and, as mother would say, purge it out so that we can, I've got to let go of what I've got so that I can grab something new. And find that joy. You know, Stephen, in closing, I want to share this very meaningful quote from your website that merits share with that merits having our grief and rebirth podcast audience hear it because you're so articulate and, and, you know, it's amazing. So in, in from your website, I picked this up. In over 20 years of work in the human transformation field, I've not seen more need and opportunity for change than today. We live in a world where everyone is preparing for an argument and begging for connection. We are drowning in information, but starving for wisdom. I believe that this is due to miscoding deep in the human mind. This coding is the root cause of all suffering in the world. By doing your shadow work, you are doing the work necessary to change the world. Stephen, your mission is so deeply in sync with the mission of Grief and Rebirth podcast, which is to educate, enlighten, and provide healing choices so that we can end the immense suffering in this world. And in doing so, transform lives and change the world. Stephen, thank you from my heart for this remarkable interview filled with so many enlightened healing insights. It's terrific. Thank you. And here is a loving reminder, everyone, that you can see the show notes and all Grief and Rebirth podcast episodes on IreneWeinberg.com. And make sure to follow us and like us on social at, at Irene S. Weinberg on Instagram, Facebook, and wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. As I like to say, to be continued. Thank you again, Stephen. Many blessings. And Thank bye you. for now. Thank that you. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.